Hi friends, Grace here. Welcome to this video where I want to share my thoughts on Ellen White as it is today on the 10th of June 2023. And I'm doing this video because this is a question I get asked a lot, especially since I have embraced the lunar Sabbath. That is, the Sabbath is based on the phases of the moon and not Pope Gregory's calendar. Many people now want to know what are my thoughts on Ellen White because she appears to write things contrary to the things that I share on my channel. So I think it's important I address this in this video today. Now for those who have followed me on this channel, you would know that I heavily promoted Ellen White as a prophet and I even believed that those Adventists who didn't follow her counsels, uh, her writings were going in the wrong direction. I believe everything she wrote was sent by God and she had an important message for us who are living in these times. Now how I came to that understanding was based on a video that I watched by Stephen Bohr. Stephen Bohr is a well-known Seventh-day Adventist pastor. He put a video together called Prophets and Time Prophecies. And when I watched that video, this was very early on as I was learning about the Seventh-day Adventist faith. After I watched that video, I became convinced that Ellen White was a prophet and I'll link the video down. After he shared that video, that seemed to ease all my doubts because at that time I was hesitant regarding Second Adventism. I came to believe the Sabbath was important. At that time I believed it was Saturday, but I had an issue with Ellen White and just anyone that called themselves a prophet because the Bible warns us there's so many false prophets. So I, I had, like, I wasn't sure about her and I wasn't really sure about Adventism, but when I watched that video, that sort of eased all my fears and I fully embraced the Seventh day Adventist faith. And the first video that I did on my channel was Prophets and Time Prophecies, pretty much that same presentation that Stephen Bohr done. I wanted the whole world to know that Ellen White is a prophet and we must follow her and abide by her writings. However, the last couple of years, I have been rethinking that sequence, that whole, and I'll talk about the sequence in a moment if you're not familiar with it, I'll summarise it quickly. And as I was looking at the sequence and the pattern, I was thinking to myself, you know what? Ellen White doesn't really fit this pattern alongside some of the other great biblical prophets as I thought to believe. There's discrepancies when it comes to Ellen White and I'll share that in a moment. And interestingly enough, last year, just out of the blue, I thought this was quite interesting, last year in September, someone wrote me a, a message, an email, saying the same thing, saying that they believe Ellen White is a prophet, but they have concerns about the pattern, and they highlight the discrepancy that I also noted as well, noticed as well. And I just said to that person, it's interesting you brought that up to me, because I was thinking the same thing. I don't have an answer for you now, but, you know, just keep searching, you know. So I just want you to understand that this is something that's been on my mind for over a year or two, but I just haven't shared it because I just wasn't really sure about it. But now, like, after the last few months, after, after I've done more studies and research, I'm pretty much convinced that um that pattern doesn't fit Ellen White. And I hope you'll see this as I present it to you today, or summarize it to you today. So um this sequence, so this sequence looks at how God works when he calls a prophet and he gives that prophet a message connected with time. You will find that when God gives a prophetic message, like a time prophecy that tells them something is going to happen at a particular day, at the point in time, he would always have a proclaiming prophet. That is someone that would give the prophet, give the message, but that message is not for that person at that time. But then at the end of the time prophecy, or just before that time prophecy is about to be fulfilled, God will raise up another prophet. That prophet we describe as the gathering prophet, and he makes that message that God gave to the first proclaiming prophet, present truth for his time. And then he takes out a remnant. So we see this sequence. It first kicks off your finds with Enoch. Enoch was a prophet. The Bible clearly tells us that in Jude. And Jude was giving a message, a twofold message about the destruction of the world. Now this message that God gave to Enoch, you find it in the book of Jude about God coming with 10,000 of his saints to punish the world for iniquity. This message, it doesn't only apply to the end of the world. It's a twofold prophecy. It also applies to the time of the flood because we know it was at the flood. There was also a huge destruction. I mean, no 
it also applied to this flood because God gave Enoch a time prophecy associated with that destruction through his son and his son is called Methuselah and Methuselah means when he dies it will be sent and Methuselah lived till 969 years he's the oldest man that ever lived to die and it was when he died the flood came you can do all the dates you can check out the video that um Stephen Ball did I did it before as well but I've removed that presentation from my channel because I don't think it's completely true but um, that part is true. You will find that Enoch, son Methuselah, lived till 969. When he died that same year, the flood came. And But before the flood came, God raised up another prophet. And that prophet was Noah. And Noah made the message that God gave to Enoch present truth for his time. So you know that Enoch was not alive on this earth to see that prophecy fulfilled, he was taken up into heaven. But just before it was fulfilled, God raised up another prophet to make that prof that message present truth and God takes out a remnant. And that person was Noah. So it's clear. First proclaiming prophet Enoch is given a message associated with time, 969 years through his son, his son dies. And then just before his son dies, God raises up Noah, Noah's presenting the message for a number of years about destruction and he makes it present truth. He's the gathering prophet and he takes out a remnant which is his family. So that lays out that first sequence. You have the proclaiming prophet which was Enoch and then you have the gathering prophet which was Noah and he made that message present truth for his time. The next example where we see this is with Abraham. Abraham, we know, is also a prophet. The Bible also describes Abraham as a prophet. And the time prophecy God gave to Abraham was the 400 years he gave, pertaining to the children of Israel being into captivity. Now we know that Abraham didn't live till 400 years. He was, he died. And then God raised up another prophet to make that message present truth. And that prophet was Moses. Moses was raised just before that prophecy was to be fulfilled and he took out a remnant which was Israel. So I hope you see where it's coming. Moses fulfills that. The next example you see is with Jeremiah. Jeremiah we know as a prophet, he's given a prophet pertaining to 70 years captivity in Babylon. We know that that wasn't fulfilled in Jeremiah for Jeremiah. However, God raised up another prophet and that was Daniel and Daniel made that prophet present truth for his time. In Daniel 9 verse 1 and 2, he talks about Jeremiah's prophecy and now he understands why they had to be in captivity for 70 years in Babylon. And Daniel was called to be a prophet at a young age when he went into captivity, he was given the gifts of visions and so on. So we see how Daniel confirms and fulfills that prophecy in his day and age. Daniel was not only a gathering prophet, you'll find, we also have him as a proclaiming prophet. He was given a 70 week prophecy, the day for a year prophecy pertaining to Messiah. We know it wasn't fulfilled for Daniel at that time. He was laid to rest, but then God raised up John the Baptist and then John the Baptist, he made that message present truth. For his day and age, he identifies Christ as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. That's the first thing he said. So we see clearly how John the Baptist fulfills that role as a gathering prophet. Now another message that we are familiar with, time prophecy, as Adventists, Adventists are very familiar with, is the 2,300 day prophecy. I wonder that was given to Daniel in Daniel 8, 14. Now, according to Stephen Ball's um, message, and I believe this as well, I shared this at that time, we said that Ellen White is the prophet that fulfills that because we said that, you know, she talks about that 2,300 days and she calls herself a prophet so she fulfills that sequence here. However, that's not completely true because Ellen White was not called to be a prophet, a gathering prophet. According to the dates that the Adventists say that the 2,300 day prophecy was fulfilled, we say it was later on during that year in December. Many Adventists would say that. So then there's a break in the pattern. That message of the 2,300 day prophecy wasn't given to Ellen White before it was to be fulfilled. It was actually given to William Miller. 
William Miller was the one before it happened that started to preach that something was about to happen. Obviously, Sir Christ was going to come. It was, he got it wrong, but he was the one that was trying to make it present truth. And then furthermore, when it did happen, God raised up Hiram Edson. He was the one that had that vision. I don't know if you're all familiar with him, but he was another pioneer that lived at that time. He was the one that was given the vision that showed Christ moving from the holy to the most holy place according to his writings. So it wasn't given to Ellen White till a later date. Now I want to read the email that this person wrote to me also, also highlighting this sort of discrepancy in the pattern. So this is the email that he wrote to me on the 24th of September, 2022. He wrote, Hi, Sister Grace, I pray you are well. Many years ago, while coming into Adventism around 2012, I was blessed by the Prophets and Time Prophecies video you presented here. I was already convicted that her writings were inspired, but I had not really established it by scriptural and personal study. Recently, I started studying the same much closer with the intent of having a document I could share with anyone who questioned my faith, especially on 1844 and the spirit of prophecy. I believed if presented properly, we could show non-SDAs why they should have a gathering profit after the 2,300 days and the fact that they don't show their lack of understanding God's pattern and the Bible especially post 31 AD and I had the same mindset when I first saw this video by Stephen Bohr I wanted to share it with everyone it was like you know what and I'm like if this is from God we need to believe her we need to accept everything that she wrote then he continues this had led me to question which you may have some insights into so this had led me to a question which you may have some insights into. I noticed that for the two, I noticed that for the 400 years, 70 years, 70 week, the gathering prophets appear just before the time is fulfilled. Yet for the 2,300 days, I believe E. Dwight began her prophetic ministry just after the close of 2,300 days. Her first vision, if I'm correct, was in December of 1844, which is correct, is way after the, that prophecy was fulfilled, according to the dates Seventh Adventists said. He said, would you have any insights into this? What could be the reason for seemingly a change from the prior patterns? I don't believe this undoes my belief in the pattern and the spirit of prophecy at all, but I would like to understand more and give an answer when questioned. And I responded to him that I don't know. I mean, what you said... I also had the same question. I just said to him, thank you for your message. Interesting you brought this up now as I have been thinking about this and revisiting the topic. This was in 24th of September, 2022. So this is before I embraced the Lunar Sabbath. I was having questions. I just want to make that clear. I agree with what you outlined below and I recall the history was Hiram Edson while walking in the cornfields was first have the vision of Christ moving into the holy place the day after the disappointment began to share it. So maybe the pattern does not entirely fit with Ellen White. That's all I can say now on the topic and it's certainly worthwhile studying again. So that was my response. I just said that, you know. Because I was thinking this, I was like, you know what? <laughs> As an seven Adventist, I was questioning it. I was like, you know what? This pattern doesn't really fit because Ellen White, it was after the date, you know. And furthermore, the prophecy that they gave at that time before it happened was wrong. All the other prophets were right. They knew what was going on, like Noah, um, Daniel, and so on. And God warns us that when he calls a prophet, he doesn't give them no false message. He, he tells them the truth, you know. So whether they were ignorant, they were doing the best. And I I've always said that God um, hid that message because God was trying to do the separating. And someone said, if you want to believe that, that's fine. All I'm saying is, is that that pattern doesn't fit correctly. Really and truly, you need to put William Miller or Hiram Edson there. Those are just my beliefs regarding it. If you want the pattern to be in sync with the other examples that we've shown. So really and truly, what I'm trying to say is when you look at the sequence, the pattern God laid out, you see that God always calls the gathering prophet, the call for prophetic ministry is established before, just before that prophecy is about to be fulfilled. And Ellen White doesn't fit that. Really and truly, 
Adventure should place either William Miller or Hiram Edson there. And William Miller was a Bible student. I mean, after October 22nd, 1844, they say that the Sabbath, the Sabbath truth was presented to him and he rejected it. I think Ellen White said that he rejected the Sabbath. Now, why did he reject it? The idea of the Saturday Sabbath. Now, why did he reject it? I haven't seen any um, records, his reasoning why. But one thing I do know is that William Miller was a Bible student. He studied his Bibles. How they came to October 22nd, 1844, the pioneers at that time, was based on the Bible and they understood that the Jews operated based on the lunar calendar. October 22nd, 1844 is based on the lunar calendar. It's not based on Pope Gregory's calendar. And it's quite funny that many Seventh-day Adventists would say to me now today that those who keep the lunar Sabbath are worshipping the moon or, you know, worshipping the sun or whatever, when their whole faith, their whole denomination is based on the lunar calendar. Because how you came to October 22nd, 1844, was based on the signs in the sky, not Pope Gregory's calendar. And as I mentioned, William Miller was a Bible student. Ellen White even wrote that Christ died on a full moon. You can read this in Desire of Ages. Christ was the Passover lamb, the 14th day of Nisan. That's when he died, right? And you can pinpoint the dates. The moon is fixed in his course. When you put the dates together, you try to apply it to the Gregorian calendar. I've said this so often. This, was, this is what did it for me. This was what did it for me is that when you put the dates together, you find that when Christ died, it was on a Tuesday. At least, at the very least, you can say it's a Wednesday. You know, that after Christ died was the Sabbath. The Bible is clear on that. So it shows to us that the Sabbath can't be on the Saturday. The Sabbath is not always on the Saturday. And this is using Adventist rules. And this is what I say to Adventists. Unfortunately, 99% of Adventists, I don't think, know what they believe or their history. They just believe the Sabbath. They know it's on the seventh day of a particular calendar. All they know is the Gregorian calendar. So automatically it's Saturday is the Sabbath, Saturday is the Sabbath. And they fail to realise that Pope Gregory's calendar is a counterfeit. And that came down later, years, hundreds of years later as a counterfeit to prevent people from knowing the truth. You know, and Adventist pastors, they know this. There's another video that I did, that I shared, where this was presented to many of the leaders in the conference and they're trying to bury and hide these truths because they don't believe that people can handle the gravity of what's happening here. You can research it, study it yourself. You know, you can prove using the Bible alone that Saturday is not the Sabbath based on the dates. I deal with factual information. I'm not about feelings or just holding on to tradition or just wanting to prove I'm right because I believed this um, maybe seven or eight months ago. I'm about facts. So when new light is presented to me, I have to examine it. And I say to you who are searching for the truth to do the same. If what you believe is truth, then you don't need to fear studying these things that I'm presenting to you all today. So this is what I wanted to share in this video based on the question. I don't want to be arguing with Adventists. I don't I hate Adventists. I know when people leave the faith, they, they may be angry and they want to attack and destroy Adventism or Adventists. I don't want to do that. And that's all I say. I just tell people to look at the evidences. Don't be scared and make your own decisions regarding this. Now back to Ellen White and um, the Prophets and Time Prophecies presentation. So all I'm saying is, is that the sequence doesn't fit. I don't believe it fits Ellen White. So even though it doesn't fit Ellen White, um, we can still say that she's written a lot of books, you know, amazing stuff in her books, Steps to Christ, Desire of Ages. And many would say, surely that's the work of a prophet. And I did believe that because Desire of Age, oh no, Steps to Christ is a beautiful book. There's lots of wonderful things that she wrote. I don't knock that at all. But then someone shared another video with me, maybe about a month or two ago. And this person is a Seven Adventist or was a Seven Adventist, I'm not sure. But he presents, and I'm going to share this video, I'll post a link to it. And I think every Adventist should watch this and make up their own mind because I never knew this before. But he really goes into the writings of Ellen White and he shows how 
a lot of her stuff, majority of it, it came from other sources. Now, I know there was a scandal a few years ago about Ellen White being a plagiarist, so many left the faith. And then the Adventists conference got a lawyer to examine the issue. And then the lawyer said that um, Ellen White is not guilty of plagiarism. And many Adventists now use this to say, oh yeah, she used other writings because God had led her to those writings and so on and so on. There's no denying that a lot of what Ellen White wrote, a lot of it is from other books, other sources. I'll link the presentation below, as I mentioned, and you can check it out. It's quite disturbing actually. So anyway, any, many adventists would say, oh yeah, we, we got a lawyer, an independent lawyer involved, and they proved that what she wrote was, um, she didn't break the plagiarist laws. However, the speaker goes on to show at that time, what classified plagiarism was when the person whom she copied from suffered a lot of income loss. There's all these technicalities into the rules of law and so on. So if the person whom she copied for didn't suffer any economical loss, like in her funds or, or finances, then it's not plagiarism. And that's what they didn't find Ellen White guilty of. It wasn't the fact that she didn't copy lots of writings, it's because they say the person didn't lose a lot of money at that time. So anyway, he goes into this, he presents all the files, all the information. But what I find horrifying is that even some of the visions that she shared were plagiarized as well, like spiritual gifts, lots of things, you know. And I was like, okay, that's a bit worrying to me. I can't imagine... I've never seen it in the Bible where God gives calls a prophet and then he's telling them to go to other writings from other sources. I don't know. Anyway, I don't even want to get into that. You can watch the video. Everyone make up their own mind. I want to make it clear that I'm not doing this. I know a lot of people may leave the faith, some Adventist faith. A lot of people are leaving the faith and they're so angry and they make videos like attacking and stuff like that. This is not what I'm about. This is a question. I just want to make this clear because I know some people would think that. This is just a question that I get asked often. And I think it's there that I explain my reasoning why. Because I know a lot of people claim to believe in Ellen White and the Seven Adventist faith because of my videos and what I shared. And now as I've grown and more light has been presented to me because the light is increasing, you grow and you learn with the movie the increasing light, a lot of those things, as God has revealed certain things to me, I don't believe it anymore, you know. So based on that, I can now say that I don't believe Ellen White is a prophet. I just don't believe that. Now, I don't believe she was a prophet. That doesn't mean I believe she's a bad person. I don't know her heart. I don't know her intentions at the time. That's something between her and God, but I'm just sharing my point of view. Now, I know there's some who disagree, some who also believe in the Lunar Sabbath or still believe she's a prophet, but she just didn't understand, it wasn't given to her, and that's fine. Everyone can believe whatever they want. I believe that everyone needs to make up their own mind, like the Bible says, work out your own salvation through fear and trembling. So all I'm doing here is just sharing my reasoning why I don't believe that anymore. I was wrong there. So I do apologise if I misled anyone or confused anyone. And through this experience, it's really humbled me to be more careful with what I share now. I don't really want to be on social media anymore because <laughs> like I've embraced the Lunar Sabbath now and I want to take my time with this now. You know, I don't want to make the same mistake that I made earlier on in my journey where I was presenting stuff and now I'm looking back 10 years later, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I, this is wrong, you know. So with the Lunar Sabbath, this is my personal journey that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing with the Lord and with the Bible. Now, I know some people have been asking me uh, about the Telegram group and studies and there are some wonderful studies going on i'll see if you're interested uh, maybe send me your email address and then i can ask the lady who organizes the studies to add you to the group i believe every sabbath every lunar sabbath we have online they have an online meeting i'm not always there i can't always make it but there is an online fellowship where they're studying these things and i join when i can and it's wonderful so if you are being convicted by the lunar sabbath and you need encouragement and support you can join those sabbath studies and there's still a telegram group going on. i'm not part of that group as i said i'm trying to cut down on social media i don't want distractions but i know a lot of you are asking questions and you want to reach out and they have a really 
good telegram group with lots of people who are into this and studying it so i'll see if i can get the link from them and then you can join that if you are interested in studying and learning more and you have questions okay so um, what i'm gonna do now i'm gonna share the first video from the person who broke down Ellen White's writings and show how a lot of it is plagiarized, just the introduction to it. And then I'll post a link to his channel then you can continue to watch the series. But I, I just want you to understand that that's, that was the nail in the coffin for me after I watched that video, that series and a few others. It sort of it solidified my belief or it changed my belief as to my thoughts on Ellen White. That was the video and it's profits and time properties, understanding that sequence again, that um, changed my, my thoughts on that. So I hope that answers your question, if you were wondering that. Also, so I just wanted to add, sorry, also another thing I wanted to add, another reason why I don't believe it is for personal issues as well, like health. A lot of people talk about the health message um, a lot of that was plagiarised as well. The guy goes into that, shows this. We can check that out if you want. And also, I don't believe in the idea of veganism. Everyone needs to be vegan before they, before Christ comes. That's not biblical. It's not even possible for the majority of people in the, that live in the world. And it can be quite harmful for some people. I mean, that was my experience, you know. So I don't believe things like that. So it's even been through personal situ things that I've gone through that she's wrote. That's just... I believe God has shown me something different. So I don't believe that idea that everyone has to be vegan and vegans live the best life and blah, blah, blah. I, I know a lot of people who have a balanced diet and they're perfectly healthy and fine. I don't believe that at all. Stuff. Another thing she said as well was she talks about the earth spinning around the sun. The Bible doesn't teach that. Regardless if you believe that or not, that's not biblical. The Bible does not teach that. All the prophets, the early reformers, White, Clear, Pass, Luther, they all knew that the Bible taught a geocentric world. That is, we don't move, we're not spinning. It's the sun and the stars that are moving above us, you know. So she taught that, the Bible doesn't teach that. And this is a few things that I've just noticed, like Saturday being the Sabbath, the continuous weekly cycle, unbroken. The Bible doesn't teach that either you know, regarding the Sabbath. I've shown that in other presentations, broken it down. Not even she kept a continuous six-day work cycle because she crossed the date line and she missed a day. So I've just, I've just seen lots of, like, hypocrisies or just confusion, you know. One minute she'll say she's a prophet, the next minute she'll say she's not. I don't know, I just think it's just, it's confusion, you know. And the only thing that I don't find confusion in is the Bible. It's what Christ taught. That's where I feel safe. That's where I feel. Shh. I just feel. I just feel safe, and I just trust the Bible one hundred percent as the way we are to live. You know, I just think that's sufficient. Another thing Ella Mike would say is that um, the Bible and the Bible alone, and then she would say those who don't believe her writings will be lost, and many Adventists use that against me. So if you don't believe what she said, she's lost. And then they will say, oh, she didn't bring nothing against the Bible. It's just confusion. So it's like, who am I rejecting here? Am I rejecting the Bible or Ellen White? I would say to you, I believe what the Bible says 100%. I believe that. What Ellen White says, I don't always believe. I don't believe what she says about the earth being the spirit because the Bible doesn't teach that. I don't believe in veganism being the, the best diet for everyone or that that's what we need to do before Christ comes. I just don't believe that. You know, I don't believe Saturday is the Sabbath. I don't believe in the continuous weekly cycle. These are things that I just don't believe through my personal study. These are my convictions. And I'm not going to pretend, you know, just to make former friends happy. You know, I can't pretend. I can't be fake against my conscience. So these are things that I truly believe, hand on my heart, without a doubt in my mind. Now, the Bible does say that if any man think if he know of anything, he know of nothing as he ought. So I try to be humble. And I always say that if people believe that I'm wrong, show it to me from the Bible. And I would like, come here and say I've made a mistake, but it has to be biblical. And unfortunately, no one's done that. It's just traditions and theories and trying to save face and not wanting to admit that they're wrong and stuff like that. I, I, I can't deal with that anymore. So um, I just want truth, I just want honesty, I want sincerity, I don't want to be arguing or fighting with anyone. I just want 
truth. That's all I'm searching for. And I think everyone should do that and continue growing in the truth as God reveals it to us. Those are my thoughts. And um, yeah, God willing, I hope you have a lovely day and God willing, you'll see or hear from me soon. Take care and God bless. As a Seventh-day Adventist, I had a nagging thought for decades. And that was, how do I know Ellen White was a true prophet? I always assumed someone had figured it out, someone smarter, maybe with a doctorate in theology. But as I grew up in the church, this question continued to nag at me. When everything closed down in 2020, I found myself with more time, and once again with this question of her authority. But I had no idea where to begin searching. How do you investigate a prophet to see whether or not they are legitimate? It's a difficult question to ask, especially when Adventism is all I've ever known. Eventually, I made an appointment with an Adventist pastor to discuss this question and to provide reasons that I should have confidence in Ellen White. But I also asked him to give me one book that would show the unfavorable side of Ellen White because I wanted to see what was written about her that was not approved by the Adventist publishing companies. I felt this was the only way to see a different perspective. He suggested I read The White Lie by Adventist pastor Walter Ray, a book featured in the August 1982 edition of Time magazine. The book documented Ray's research where he found that Ellen White had copied from various authors and passed them off as her own work. However, before purchasing this book, I felt very conflicted, and I'll admit that this was one of the hardest purchases I have ever made. You may think that's a strange thing to say, but you have to understand growing up in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, there is a general consensus about questioning Ellen White. People will warn you to be careful about investigating her. They will caution you about being deceived. Even Ellen White warned that there would be those who would lose confidence in her writings and fall away from Bible truth. But even after all of these warnings circled in my head for a while, I couldn't continue to live with this nagging feeling that something was amiss. How can we test if Ellen White is a true prophet, if the only books we read are those that endorse her as a true prophet? How is that consistent with intellectual honesty? The only way we can substantiate that we are not deceived ourselves is to investigate her. I feel it goes to show how sheltered we as Adventists are that we are not even aware that there are books and resources out there that shed different light on our prophet and beliefs. Or perhaps I didn't look. Perhaps you didn't look. We tell each other that we have the truth after all, and we caution against looking outside of our community for answers. In the beginning of his book, he mentions he was informed that the book Sketches from the Life of Paul by Ellen White, written in 1883, was largely copied from another book on the life of Paul by authors Coney Bear and Hawson, all under the guise that the book was inspired by God. This piqued my interest and I decided to begin my investigation into her validity with this specific book. But at the same time, I asked myself, why would a prophet need to take others' writings? How could this be acceptable? If someone reports they are receiving light from God and that we should take their messages seriously or we are rejecting God, should it not create suspicion when we see that that individual has taken others' writings and ideas and passed them off as her own under the name of the spirit of prophecy? At the very least, shouldn't we who have been raised in Adventism investigate her? Why is this not common? I have not found any friends or family who have spent any significant amount of time investigating her. Wouldn't we suggest to Mormons to look into Joseph Smith or the Christian scientists to test Mary Baker Eddy? But as I began to search, I found that most Adventists believe our prophet is off limits to this type of scrutiny. Why? I suppose it makes sense that because she is our prophet, and because our parents and friends believe in her, that to challenge her is to challenge our very core, which can complicate relationships. But how can we simply turn our head and ignore any evidence that challenges our paradigm as Adventists? It's not sinful to investigate a prophet. In 1 John 4, 1, we read, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So I ask you, as I have asked myself, have you tested Ellen White? Or have you only read the defenses by the church that then satisfy your own confirmation bias? I'll admit, after I read The White Lie, I could see why I had not heard of it in Sabbath school or the Adventist school system or even in Adventist graduate school. It is quite eye-opening and certainly provides a different perspective and raises many questions. Of course, this is not the only book that has been written opposing Ellen White. 
but I wanted to start my investigation with this book, and specifically the idea of her using others' writings. So in the initial few videos, I will be discussing plagiarism, beginning with that certain infamous but scarce book by Ellen White entitled Sketches from the Life of Paul. I have over 200 examples from this book, which I plan to show on camera, where she copied from other authors without giving credit. My goal is to examine both sides of the issue, so I will also be discussing the Avenus counterarguments. After I have discussed plagiarism, I will be testing Ellen White by her own writings and by the Bible. So if you have had some of these same questions and you would like to study with me, feel free to subscribe or check back and write in the comments below. I welcome any discussion. I'll see you in the next one.